I know this has been one of my most anticipated honest looks ever since I threatened it on the Ruby podcast a while ago. I hope not to disappoint you, but everything I can say here I've already said in numerous podcasts, chats, and reviews. As I scrubbed through a lot of the older volumes for footage, there's two things I realized. First thing was, wow, the writing was always kind of bad. Second thing was that all the characters in Ruby are just less compelling versions of other characters. This is a symptom of the disease that is Monty, Miles, Carrie, and Gray's insistence on treating anime like a genre. Treating something as broad as anime like a specific genre pretty much forces characters into archetypes and, more often than not, they never escape. Ruby is Captain America by way of Maka Albarn. Weiss basically goes through the same motions as Doctor Strange sans hand injury. Blake has a lot in common with other tragic heroes who started off with the villains. Yang is basically Goku, though I think she's more like Gohan, especially since the most interesting thing about her is her relation to the other characters. While some of these comparisons might be a bit of a stretch, one that isn't is dear old Ozpin. Ozpin is just shitty Dumbledore. I could end the video there, but I like these honest looks to strike that mediocre balance of overthinking and oversimplifying, so let's get pedantic on this ponce. Ruby was a lot easier to follow when there was no magic involved. The abrupt appearance and reliance on magic is like if all of a sudden a show dedicated to glowy hand magic completely switched gears to have psychic ghost monsters with specific power sets instead, and yes, that was a JoJo reference. Ozpin was cursed by the God Brothers for failing to stop Salem. How he failed and how he's still the one with all the power even though he failed is beyond me. This isn't a speculation show, it's an opinion show. And my opinion is that Ozpin hasn't made a single rational decision the entire series. First off, the Maidens. Ozpin gave these four women incredible power just for keeping him company while he sat around. That power also came with risks that ended up causing more trouble than they're worth. If he could set the rules on how maidens are transferred, why didn't he? If he couldn't, why not? Why does it transfer in this way and why can this grim stuff forcefully extract it? And why have one of the key figures defending the maidens be the guy whose semblance is literally bad luck? Rather ridiculous sounding out loud, isn't it? I don't know what Ozpin was thinking when he decided to give a pair of bandit kids the ability to turn into birds. I also don't know why that's just something he can do. I offered an idea in a previous podcast that maybe he can do this with all his top lieutenants and he can't control what animal they can turn into. Crow and Raven can be birds because of course. Lionheart can be a lion for obvious reasons. Ironwood could be a bear because that would be so freaking metal. And Glinda could be a horse because everyone wants a ride. As helpful as that might be, unfortunately, it is not that simple. It really looks like he only gave it to Crow and Raven because they happened to be on the same team as some Rose, a Silver-Eyed Warrior. And they both had bird names, so that was recent enough to put that kind of pressure on them. And here's the thing that really grinds my gears. He treats Salem like a huge, unstoppable threat, yet he has an entire army of huntsmen at his disposal. Hundreds of huntsmen, any one of them, capable of clearing out hordes of Grimm. And what does Salem have? Those same, useless Grimm, and like, three decent fighters. And the only way Salem is able to get so much done isn't because of her own merits, but because she's slightly more competent than Ozpin. The school system, the kingdom structure, the CCT network, all of this was done under Ozpin's guidance. If he could make one relic hard to get, why not make them all hard to get? Why even hide them? Why not use them against the Grimm and as a way to make the people of Remnant feel safer? Why not use the Maidens the same way My Hero Academia uses All Might? He calls the CCT network's fatal flaw poetic, and it bites him square in the ass. All it took was a single virus to put all the kingdoms at each other's throats. He buried relics in vaults under the schools hoping that the sheer number of students would be able to defend them, yet when danger struck, most of the students ran. Not only that, but it's hard to defend something when you don't even know you're supposed to be defending it. What would this school need to hide? And I haven't even gotten to how he needlessly puts all the characters' lives at risk. 
He knows full well that Jean forged his transcripts, yet he placed him as the leader of the team with his Fall Maiden candidate. He knows Ruby is probably the only Silver-Eyed Warrior alive, and yet sends her on extremely risky missions, and this is actually one of his better actions. I'm actually going to defend this particular instance. Ruby was going to get there one way or another. We mail ourselves there. So, best to at least give them a huntsman who knows exactly what's going on and why Team Ruby wanted to go there. And a likely place for a hideout. Precisely. It's also implied that the only reason it was restricted from first years is because Ozpin didn't want any other team to sign up for it before Ruby got a chance. I mean, first years are the only ones there, so why would a mission off limits to first years be on the first years mission board? Would all first year students please report to the amphitheater? And then in volume 3, he chooses Pura to become the Fall Maiden, unsure if the transfer would actually work. Luckily, that's a possibility that doesn't even get answered because of Cinder. Cinder vaporizes him and he goes into Oscar. In layman's terms, he is a shitty Luke Skywalker. His first appearance does nothing. His second appearance establishes that Ozpin is in his head. His third appearance is him doubting Ozpin. His fourth appearance is him getting a ticket to Mistral. His final appearance in Volume 4 is him on the train. From there, he's just used to deliver exposition. <laughs> Much like his second and third appearance, character traits are brought up and never addressed again. And with only one month of training, he's able to hold his own against a headmaster even better than Crow of all people? Ozpin has a lot to answer for. I'm not going to say he should have stayed dead. There's too much ground that needed to be covered by his character post Volume 3, and if that's Oscar's only role, then that's fine. Or at least it would be if there wasn't so much problematic stuff with the story. And that's the icing on this shit salad. Everything he's done has made Salem's job easier. People don't like being lied to. They especially don't like being lied to about things that would otherwise help. Hazel hates him because of how he treats huntsmen like tools. I'm sure there's a lot more stuff like that coming in the future. Ozpin is not a bad idea. He's just a bad character, and his badness is so self-evident that there's a prevailing theory that he may actually be the villain. I think that speaks volumes about how mishandled this character has been. I'm Mediocrity4, thanks for watching.